how kind of the close examination of them is sort of out of whack with a uh, great man theory of history, which ties in very well with novels where you want to have a protagonist. So the first question I want to throw out there for <coughs> anyone who wants to tackle it is, you know, how do you write about and something as big and like all penetrating as you know yeah, an well, economy yeah. without kind of losing track of all the cogs? Like, how do you balance those two understandings? I think for me, uh, what I always keep in mind is what I choose to share is what the character, what is important to the character, what the character notices, um, what actually affects them. I think as far as, again, economy goes in our own lives, the things that we understand, oh, taxes, right? Like we understand that because that affects us directly. Um, other things we don't understand quite as well. Um, and those are the things that kind of get, you know, brushed under the rug. Uh, or that we have uh, let other people, uh, you know, handle. So for me, I really try to focus on, okay, if I have a, you know, kind of a character who is not involved in government, who's not involved in these things, but who's affected by, you know, economic policies, I will just show them in different interactions and how those maybe impede their goals. Uh, and uh, and should then show kind of how those, uh, you know, economies work. I think uh, in the Godzilla trilogy, they actually have bugs as a form of currency. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the things that's explored without explicitly like, and here's a 12-page treatise about the bug economy. You simply show people interacting in their world. So. I find uh, also very often I don't necessarily directly sit down and say, what's the economy of the universe? But I do try and ask questions like, what are people eating and where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. Who's doing the labor that you never see because the heroes are just off on their adventure? Who's cooking their food and washing their clothes and where is all of that coming from? And that ties straight into how are goods flowing, how is money flowing, and, uh, and so it's more foundational, but I think it really lends a solidity to the fictional world that you're creating. And since your ancillary books are about essentially servant class, you get a lot of opportunities to you, you automatically have a protagonist who's very interested in that, in those dynamics. Exactly, yeah. I think uh, sort of market, men, the mental construct of the market informs so much of the way we, like sort of 21st century, especially Americans, um, encounter stuff that it then goes back and structures the way that we approach fantasy and we conceive of fantasy. And if any tabletop role players in the audience Right, okay, so do you think that there were actually inns in the way there are in the standard Dungeons and Dragons campaign in like Shakespeare's England? Um, where you could like go and spend a few gold and like have the room upstairs that gets cleaned by housekeeping every night? I mean, there are a lot of structures that get imposed by moderns who are looking back on, on uh, a reality that was very, very different. Um, and I think that has a tendency to sneak in to the worlds that we create. Um, there's this wonderful line in uh, the beginning of Slavoj Žižek's Pervert's Guide to Ideology, um, where he talks about how, um, in, in conversation about John Carpenter's uh, They Live, about you know, how we are always eating the garbage, right? That when we are attempting to escape an ideological system, it's when we're most in the ideological system, because in our attempts to escape, we're leaving reality behind. All that's left for us is ideology, and that sort of, and, and so we sort of fill a space with ideology. So, I think that economics awareness of economics is super important for trying to understand how I'm like pre-building the world before I even start to build it, and then that's going to affect where where the characters, sort of the options that are open to the characters, the fields of action in which they can participate. Um, <clears throat> I don't think economics necessarily are important to the characters, just just, just take the opposite tack, sure. just for fun. Um, it, it all depends on what kind of what, what kind of novel you're constructing yeah. and what your contract with the audience is. Mm -hmm. Like like if, if you just want to write a you know a fun, totally in the genre, sword and sorcery kind of thing, mm -hmm. and, and you're gonna be like, you know what? There's inns. It works just like a hotel mm -hmm. because that's not important to to the story I'm telling, then that's your contract with the audience and and, and, and you can explore that and everybody goes Okay, you know, in Star Wars, I'm not going to worry about certain how how certain things work, like like why you would use swords instead of guns all the time, right? Or or I know there's a lot of backfilling that, that people have done to sort of make that make sense, but <clears throat> I think all of us do actually do what you're talking about and, and and try to make things make sense and do look at at, at things. And what I like to do is is I like to um, kind of zoom out, like, like zoom in and then zoom out. And, and if, if readers think that the, uh, if you show that the, the things on the micro scale kind of make sense, yeah. 
um, that when you zoom out, they feel that the world's big and like you figured all this stuff out. And it helps when you do actually figure some of the stuff out. Um, like there's a war going on, but you can't. This country can't get saltpeter or something, or, or you know, you can't, can't get to the guano caves, and and, and so you can't get. I you, 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 you know, or, or gunpowder, or, you, you, you know, what, what what have you. Um, then that affects your world. And if you show readers that, then then they go, okay, this world makes sense, and and he's thought about it. And you don't need to make. You don't need as a, as an author to create the entire world. You just need to paint beyond the borders of the picture. That they're seeing, like you go beyond the frame, and then you bring bring the picture in. They're like, "There's a whole world beyond the frame." And you're like, "Well, it, it goes out this far," and so so so, so that's a, a storytelling device that I like to use. Yeah. Um, but but you actually, when when you write historically, um, I can take a little more time. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> when you write a little more historically, um, you can really get into trouble, too, if you try to be more accurate. Like in in, in my. Uh, in, in my most recent series, I've I've got slavery. There's slaves, and the the characters, the main characters, some of whom are, are pretty good people, like don't think about it, or at least some of them don't think about it at all. They just take it for granted. It's normalized. Yeah. Like it's totally normalized. And I don't approve of slavery, but some of them just don't see it. It's just a blind spot for because them. They wouldn't. Because they wouldn't, right? Yeah. And and I've gotten more angry emails about having slavery in my books than about cannibalism. <laughs> and and and, and so, so so it's 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 interesting. You know, these are just challenges that we choose to take on as authors. Like, what's interesting to us, and can I make it interesting to you now? And the, this is a really great point because I think uh, Brent touches on this idea that, like, some of us are like worldly geeks, like me and Max. So, yeah, and, and, and I'm like, I, it's like I love to get into the nitty gritty, but a lot of the audience is like, I could get right. crap. Right. Right. I, I'm there. I want an adventure. Right. I want to have fun. Well, I just want to. It could be the same. It could be the same. Reader. Reader. Sometimes, sure. right? right. Um, someone was just talking about actually how you know they've gone through a really bad year and they wrote they read like 87 Star Wars novels in one year because it was comforting. <laughs> so I think she was just like it was really comforting. I was going through a really bad time and I needed that comfort right. fiction. Right. Right. Important that that's so there. yeah, like we need those things. Um, so I think that's also you know an interesting point is that you know sometimes we just. And sometimes we do care because we're reading for this specific thing, and we want to know that you did your homework, you know, as an author. Or we're looking to expand stuff, and sometimes we just want to yeah, have an adventure. I just want to cry. I don't want to read care. this book. You know, yeah, like, like, you know. Like, why are you um, crying? So. <laughs> Absolutely, but like in, in both cases, there's world building that's going on. Sure. It's just mm -hmm. when you're not affirmatively departing from like the world that we kind of inhabit, mm -hmm. then it, that sort of gets autofilled, mm -hmm. and right. you, get to, you get to use that as a tool in your arsenal if you uh -huh. want to. Mm -hmm. So let's let's uh, take the opportunity to like push into kind of I think the heart of the panel, which is like I think this panel is really interested in books that become about the economy in certain ways and like use a deep understanding of the economy and kind of an economically motivated plot mm -hmm. to drive plot to drive action and um, you know one one way you can see this manifest is there are examples in history of you know the economists looking at a subject and saying, if this happens, this will happen. There are times where economics is pretty similar to, like, prophecy. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think that, like, there are times when a deep understanding of the economy is kind of taking the place of very well accepted, you know, fancy tropes, like prophecies or, you know, inevitable things happening that are happening instead of because of, like, fate has been foretold, but because economic situations are coming in a place where it's inevitable. I mean, I guess science fiction kind of always used this, but... To some extent, I think, too. It, yeah, it's, I guess it's hard to separate out because uh, when you're living in a world, the economic situation has such a huge impact on what you do that the two are kind of inseparable. Your destiny or the economic situation that you're in, they, you know, it's hard to separate them out. Uh, and I think in most cases, the economy isn't visible on the surface. It's just kind of underneath, and so the reader isn't going to see it but it's sort of moving things around in the plot, where the prophecy thing is usually often like right on the surface. I mean, to commit the grand in my book fallacy, right? Um, I started getting really interested in this stuff back in 2008, when I just come back from China and like everything was falling apart. And I was looking for work, and it occurred to me, I, I was struck by just how much this kind of consensus reality, that everything is completely cool and we're not, um, <laughs> We're not constantly, we're not supporting our entire society off of bets made off of bets made off of bets that are 
rolling on a day-to-day -day basis in order to permit these enormous like conceptual entities to continue surviving for t the next 24 hours. Um, oh wait, no, we actually are doing that, and then everything's horrible forever, and you know trillions of dollars just disappeared overnight without any detectable physical change in the like universe that like, we thought we inhabited. And the only rhetoric that I had for it was rhetoric of fantasy. Um, and so, so the sort of causal connection goes in different lines for me. Like, oh, well, okay, you've got gods dying. This is what's going on. Um, good talk. Good <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, no, but like, no, yeah. well, I, I yeah, always go point. back to Trader Bear Cormorant. Right, right? Yeah, yeah, Every, totally. This is like the Trader Bear Cormorant con. Uh, but uh, <laughs> where, you know, we forget that, you know, so we can actually drive entire plots uh, based on banking and based on uh, toppling the uh, currency markets of a particular country and drive them into destitution. And you don't always have to pick a sword. And I think it's fascinating. Uh, Daniel Abraham does that. Uh, he has a whole thing about banking as well uh, in his, I think, the dagger. The dagger and the coin. The dagger and the coin, yeah. Um, so there's a whole, a whole, you know, banking thing. I did it 20 years ago. <laughs> there's that, you know. Um, so, so it's one of those things where I think we, a lot of times we think, oh, let's go punching things, when in fact uh, the way we wage war now, right, is, is a lot about, um, you know, sinking economies. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, intelligent, wars of intelligence um, and things like that, which are very fascinating and interesting. Again, sometimes we just want to punch things, but occasionally it is fun to see, hey, you know what, you could go behind the scenes, never pick up a sword, and destroy an entire countries, an entire country, and like starve millions of people. Even on totally cool! Anyway. And, 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 well, yeah, and even on a micro level, um, you know, you've got Breaking Bad, which is the like five season long grand tragedy of the American healthcare system. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just to play on that a little bit, so I think one of the things that's interesting is you can't really write about something you can't conceive of. And sometimes reality brings out some really interesting storylines that you wouldn't have thought of. And uh, I'm just wondering if, you know, if, is there a way that you have done like uh, brainstorming or something like that to really come out with economies and ideas in economies? I mean, who would have thought that, you know, these toxic assets that these banks exchange would cause poor people to lose their homes? And the question is like, how do you synthesize the economic end of the day into your world building? How does your understanding of stories you're telling change based on, you know, the revealed horrors and wonders of the economic system that we're living in. Well, w w one of the things that, that I do is I just read history, and interesting stuff happens, and, and, and then you brainstorm from it. Um, so, so finding out that um, in ancient Greece, um, <clears throat> families all wanted to have slaves, and it's super hard to find, figure out how many slaves were owned because people didn't really pay attention to that sort of thing. But it was, it was a status symbol to have a slave or to have more than one slave. So a lot of families would buy slaves and then wouldn't really be able to afford their upkeep. And so then they would rent them out to places. So, so, so um, <clears throat> but if you're a particularly bad slave, they would rent you out to, if, you know, sorry, you, you understand what I mean, right? Like, if, if, if they particularly wanted to punish you, they would rent you out to the silver mines, where tons and tons of people would die. So, 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 so it, it became this mechanism to, uh, to, 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 to keep people, to keep the slaves obedient. Right is is like you, you have to keep you have to keep your master happy, or you will be sent to the silver mines, and and, and they'll get enough from your sale or your rental to buy another slave, and, and so like, like like these methods of control are tied to economics, and um, and, and it brings forth all sorts of interesting um, conflicts to my mind. Just thinking of a family that like tries to be good to their slave, but they can't afford them, and they have to send them off somewhere. Like, that's an interesting, like, moral dilemma, and, and it's brought on by their economics. Maybe their greed, because they couldn't afford a slave. And then there's all the things, of, obviously, that shows you what's wrong with slavery. Um, but, 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 but those sort of economic truths uh, drive things. And, and all, the, all, these, all these forms of power, I think, are tied together. Um, Karl von Clausewitz, who was a, a, a theorist, a, a war theorist, he said that, um, that war is a continuation of politics by other means. And, and so, so these are exercises of power. It's, it's like, well, when you're rich, you have freedom, you have power. You, like, somebody comes knocking at your door and says, you have to pay me $1,000 or I'll take your house. You say, here's $1,000. Um, and and you know, in times past, you might have to go to debtor's prison. So, so, so like all these conflicts, things are tied to money and power are sort of interchangeable in a lot of ways.
And I also like the idea of interrogating that, right? As right, sure. speculative fiction writers, uh, Emma Newman has a great book called Planetfall, and um, it's about this a thou the thousand people who go and they colonize this uh, a new uh, planet, and they have to like it is a, like a cooperative communistic, you know, thing, which has its own stuff, right? We got, you know, the commune, uh, you know, uh, how the politics go in communes. Um, so it has, and it has its own, this idea of economy that is completely not tied to commerce uh, as far as, like, you know, hard currency and things go. And just kind of looking at how it has so much more to do with the relationships between the people and how, you know, oh, you did me this favor, so I'll do this favor, um, and how the community actually gets along uh, by itself. Uh, so I, again, I'm totally yeah, historian, right. total nerd. Um, so I love that stuff, too. But then I also go to, okay, well, what else can we do that, like, unleashes us from that, you know, that thing, because you're like, oh, historical, you know, whatever. And, like, what else can we do that's, like, really fascinating and interesting and kind of unties us and shackles us. Well, and, and American history has, has a, a ton of, like, utopian movements. Like, mm -hmm. people go, you know what, we hate money, we hate this, let's go, we're going to go sit there and we'll all do a day's work and everything will be fine. And then, I don't know if any of them have actually stayed together, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, like, but, but they, they, they all fall apart in one way or another. And, and those can have interesting lessons about Pardon me, uh, about human nature, yeah. or or about you know failings of people. Or like, well, I don't want to work today. You know, well, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> yeah. Well, and comparative economics also gets really interesting mm. in this way, which sort of verges on anthropology oh, sure. also, um, because the fact is, modern sort of capital markets are only the most recent form and currently dominant form of economic technology, and there have been lots of different ones that have been deployed over all of human history that we have access to. So. You can think about, um, so David Graeber has this wonderful little book, not actually a little book, called Debt in the First 5,000 Years. <laughs> small, <laughs> small. It's a small book. You know? <laughs> it's only like 0.75 way of kings. Yeah. Right. Ways of king. Words um, is of radiances are now. Words is of radiances. <laughs> words is of radiances. Um, and it's... And so this is a book about the evolution of the concept of debt and the concept of money, and it turns out that you actually have debt and notions of social debtedness and recorded debt before you have actual currency. Mm -hmm. um, and the sort of barter system to monetary units myth that was created really was a myth that was created to justify the origins of classical economics when Smith and his people were running around and trying to make this as a science. They needed to have a genealogy in order to have a working science. So there's like this really cool rhetorical canon creation thing that happens. Um, and you know, Michael Tausig's work about um, non-capital economies being sort of forced to move into a capitalized Western agriculture space and books like Devil and Commodity Fetishism in South America and Jim Scott's, James C. E. Scott's work on, um, on modernity and sort of the imposition of structure and things like seeing like a state. So there are a lot of different options. And e but if you thinking of it as comparative economics and economics as, a, as the science or study of what happens when we don't have enough resources to do everything that we want to do forever, really in a way economics becomes a science of story, it becomes a science of science. peril and risk. Which are really what we're sitting down to deal with right. when we're writing stories. So, Max, obviously, your work is because of its inspiration cues quite closely to a late yeah. capitalist model of economics. But for like uh, Cameron and your books are both kind of projections into a really like I'm, I'm talking about your um, bug books. I don't remember the the bug books. Uh, the bug books. God's Earth trilogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Those are both projections in a world that can be quite different. How do you how do you choose? which economic truths of today to keep and which to unlearn to like build up a new structure? It really depends on uh, which ones serve the kind of story that I'm trying to tell and which ones will help build the world convincingly. Because I, I start, like I said, with where are things coming from because then that, as Max said, constrains the options available to my characters. And so I need to know those things before I start. Um, but I have to admit, I've been kind of frustrated with, I don't want to write stories where it's all market capitalism, right? But that's the only system I have ever known. Mm -hmm. And I don't, it's really, really difficult, if not impossible, to write science fiction that isn't really deeply rooted in the time that it's written. So that's something that I've been kind of personally trying to work away from. But I know, I can see it every time I'm writing in the story, and I'm like, oh, this is assuming a market, right? This is assuming 
the exact kind of you know currency and market that I'm used to, and it probably wouldn't even apply here, and I can try and nudge it away, but I'm not sure I'm entirely successful. But I think it's something that's important to do because you can't step into a future of something different without having begun to envision something different, you know. Yeah, in the Mirror Empire books, actually, there was uh, the, the polyamorous communistic matriarchy, uh, which I don't ask me how that came about. Um, and a lot of it was me saying, hey, I want to do something that I haven't seen before. Um, what is the most, you know, uh, outrageous thing that I could possibly think of? Because, again, we're writing freaking fantasy. Like, shouldn't we have something like, you can do anything with fantasy. And it's so weird that so much of it ends up kind of looking kind of like, again, coming from where we all, we all come from the same place. But it all kind of looks the same. And I said, I want to create these five different societies, and there's a reason they're all very different uh, in this world, and, uh, and, and kind of let them loose and say, okay, you've been doing this for 500 years or 1,000 years. What is the end result? I don't know, again, how, how you end up getting there, but I want to see what now, what are you now that you are there. Um, and I've had a lot of you know, really positive reactions to people who are like, I didn't even think. You know, again, it's, all, it's all about what, what we can believe uh, to actually be. Like, we can't make something that we cannot conceive of. Um, I think there was just someone uh, uh, just broke the, the faster uh, the light barrier with a neutrino or something. But again, there's like all these things that we say, this is impossible oh, and I can't. It was the me. Was yeah, I know. I think, I was think it was debunked? I think it was debunked. Damn it. We're almost was there. Was Listen. <laughs> um, here's my thing though. Because we can conceive of it, we try and do it. If we say it's impossible, then we go, oh, well, that's impossible. I can't do it. Um, and I love the idea that science fiction and speculative fiction gives us this um, sandbox to play in that says anything could absolutely be possible, and that's why we have, you know, we our little pocket computers now, right? Um, because we can actually conceive of that, and we've seen that before, and now we can build it. So, and I believe that applies to social science, and I think we use it a lot with the tech, and we don't apply it to the social stuff and the economics and all those because they're much harder to change than. Um, that is much more difficult, but to me is much more interesting to explore. So. I think we're about halfway through the panel, so I'm going to open up to questions now. Anyone got any questions about the economy? One of the things that, um, and I agree with Anne, it's difficult to do. And I'm an economist, so it's something I've thought about. The idea that uh, I think a lot of people have is that you know, free market capitalism is like the end of history. The epic. You know, oh, we've yeah, got this here. is what we've, we've got, yeah, tried even, to even though, it's right, yeah. Yeah. even though it's only been around yeah. for about 400 years. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and I've read that the uh, some of the historical stuff about the things people had to go through to create this system, dragging people who didn't want to do things that way, no, you must do it this way, we will force you to do it this way. Uh, so obviously, something's going to happen. I think Ian Banks has actually done some interesting stuff there. But the thing that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, what happens if we talk about a change in the social structure as is happening, that, uh, you know, if men and women are participating equally, um, you know, how does that change things? Well, and that's, that's really, uh, I, I am not an expert in economics, but I recall uh, an anthropology class I took in college where the professor said that uh, it, a theory, I don't remember where it came from, was that capitalism could only work if you had a subsidized, a portion of your workforce was being subsidized, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you mention men and women having different roles, what essentially uh, the traditional marriage arrangement where women stay home and take care of the kids they're basically subsidizing, they're providing free servant labor to men who can then go out and do other jobs and not worry about where their children are, right? Well, when that's gone, when, when there isn't free servant labor available to all your workers, that's gonna drastically change what you can actually ask of your employees and drastically change what they're gonna expect back and that's gonna cause some shifts, which of course it is causing some shifts, right? Oh. Oh. There's I don't know if it's a true theory, but it was just something that connected in my well, mind. There. Yeah, there, there's an apocryphal story uh, of uh, the steam engine, uh, you know, getting uh, introduced in ancient Greece, uh, and you know, guys were, hey, you know, this can take the the, uh, the labor away from all these, you know, men numbers of people. This is gonna be amazing. It's gonna be this, the greatest thing we should use for everything. And uh, you know, the guys in charge went, well, yeah, but what do we do with all the slaves? <laughs> it, it would completely change the way that they 
organized their society. Um, and I think it, again, in the US, of course, we have thrown under the rug a lot of the things that happened, the decisions that were made in our country uh, related to labor. Um, and I think we need to keep, you know, consider those and keep them in mind when we're building our society. It's like, well, again, where did this stuff come from? Who is in charge? Well, we, we do, we, and I mean, this is my favorite, the, uh, the strong, uh, the, the woman, uh, the woman soldier, which means, oh, the society is equal. And I'm like, have you thought this all through? Like, who's, who's doing all these roles, right? It's cool that you got, you know, hey, there's also a woman soldier. Is that, is this a gendered thing? Or are there, who's, who's staying home to take care of the kids? Who is in charge of making the textiles? Who's at home with, you know, make, weaving the baskets? Like, you, you do need to actually take those, yeah, like, take that through when you, there's always someone who has to do the work. And we've seen that throughout history. Um, and when you change one key thing, you need to bring that through and say, OK, then we need to redistribute the labor in a much different way. Um, and that's a lot of thinking that is very hard for us. We don't want to do. But uh, it's fascinating to me. That's why I write what I write. Um, again, sometimes, you know, whatever people read for different reasons. Um, but that's what I like to get into is, OK, if I change this, how does that affect everything else? Because certainly throughout history, it has been absolutely thought through, you know, many, many times. Yeah, so. we're already getting some of the snowflake effects of, of this particular change, right? This existence of the two-income trap mm -hmm. being a really mm -hmm. obvious sort of tack on the fact that, you know, it used to be that you had sort of one, one income in the family, and then, you know, prices were sort of this much of the income, and then over time the income has remained stable and prices have risen, basically. So now, you know, we had this enormous, um, we had a sort of rise in per capita in household income, not per capita income, because all of a sudden there were two earners in the family. But now prices have risen to the point where without either of those two earners, the household lifestyle is unsustainable. And then you end up in serious credit card trouble because actually having two income earners in a household is a very precarious position. And you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And then, and then you end up in an America where everybody's carrying a lot of credit card debt and things are pretty onerous. This it's is very challenging. unsustainable. Yeah. It's unsustainable. Yeah, it's, it's, it, is, it, is, it is transparently unsustainable, yeah. but we haven't developed the political will yet to really change that or to respond to the consequences of this very simple and like good shift. Yeah. But, but one of the things that happens with that shift is that children become extremely unaffordable. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 and you get people like, well, you share the birth rate right. if, if women are free to take up whatever career or occupation or job they choose or can qualify for, um, they have fewer children. Which which has a lot its fewer. Own which, economic. Which has good part China's part right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, China's, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you get the you get the the div, the sort of um, demographic dividends, right? Uh -huh. Where like um, industrialization and peace lead to a sort of a baby boom that then has concomitant like production gains, and then over time you have this aging population that, and a, a shrinking younger population that's stuck having to not only service all the debt but actually provide physically services for an aging population. Demographic trends are shifting. Yes. Cameron said something that I'm going to disagree with. That someone has okay, to but doesn't end with a question. <laughs> yeah. Got to end with a question, not a comment. Oh, said, sorry. <laughs> Someone has to do the work. Right now, we are looking at an economy where jobs are disappearing. Mm -hmm. Do I, we? Does someone need to do the work? And certain kinds of work. There are certain kinds yes. of work that will never go away. Feeding people, taking care of children, health care, uh, funeral services. Uh, all those things are never going to go away. Those jobs are not disappearing. Of course, those jobs are not being paid very well, are they? Right. right? And that's the. The kinds of jobs that pay well that aren't, yeah, are the ones that are sort of disappearing. And we're also looking at, and it's again, it's a shift. There's a shift to the creative class. And unfortunately, our schools are still set up to make factory workers. And that's what we're all trained to do. And we're trained to, you know, follow instructions and do what we're told. And in fact, when you actually get out into the workplace right now, what they're actually looking for are people who can think outside the box, who can come up with these new technologies, who can get into and, and, and think outside, you know, do all those things. Um, and we have not trained. We do not have people trained for the actual jobs that we have now, so we are definitely in a 
in a place of flux, for sure. And it's this is where the real interesting science fiction is going to come from, right? right? Like, I was really fascinated when you were like, oh, and I was thinking in 2008, you came up with this yeah. idea of this book. I'm like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense now that I look back at it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, the, the interesting science fiction comes from like, okay, so we're going to not need a lot of work. You're absolutely right. There are some types of jobs that will yeah. never go away. But all the types of jobs that, are never, that will never go away are currently relatively poorly compensated, and maybe maybe this is where universal basic income steps in to, to take up the mantle, or maybe we just radically redefine what work means, or maybe we need a stronger safety net so that people can tr go out and try to build something amazing and fail, burn, have it burn over, fall, burn down, fall over, and then sink into the swamp seven or eight times.